So um, <coughs> thanks, Joanne, and thanks to the Tomas, especially thanks to Christiana and SBA and everyone else who contributed to this event. Um, Joanne just told you why you should write about digital art. Um, so I will try to be ambitious and tell you how. Um, so how to write about art. Um, oh, and we'll make it digital art in five or 10 minutes. Um, so um, I think, you know, my experience has suggested that it helps to take a stand. And this is something that if you look at 90% of the writing about art, especially that comes out of academies, like out of universities and so forth, you will not see. People will make a stand maybe on whether a, you know, a certain uh, uh, academic who wrote a theoretical paper you know, might have gotten some facts wrong or something, but they won't actually take a stand on the works themselves. And I think when we have to say we're writing about art, we really are writing about art, not just general digital culture, but about specific pieces, not individuals, but individual works, and whether they are good or bad. So uh, At the Edge of Art was a book I wrote um, in 2006 with Jolene Blay, where we were looking at art practiced um, on the edge, meaning artists on the cutting edge, which we always think of, oh yes, artists on the cutting edge, but we rarely go beyond that edge and say, who are people out there who are doing work like art, but are not recognized as artists, and don't even call themselves artists. So the goal of this book was to go past that and sort of say, who is out there? And in order to do that, we had to make value judgments. And value judgments mean this work is good, that work is bad. And that's something that I would recommend you do as an art writer, A, because there's so little of it, but B, because taking a stand makes your writing more exciting and it makes the field more invigorating because then people get in debates with you. And you might think that as a student, well, I don't want it to draw attention to myself, but as a writer, you do. That's why you're writing. Um, so, um, you know, people look at, I look at this diamond encrusted skull by, you know, Damien Hirst, um, and um, people would say, well, that's problematic. You know, I don't think you should say it's problematic. I think you should say it's bad. Um, and I can talk about why it's bad, but um, that's a, a, a level of judgment, whether you agree or not with this particular one, that will draw people out. And well, what do you mean it's bad? Jimmy Nurse is a genius, you know, and suddenly you get a conversation going. Similarly with things that you might like, like Joan Jonas, well, it's not without merit. <laughs> okay, I think you mean that it is good, right? Let's say that it's good, and let's say why that it's good. Let's not, you know, kind of pull our punches. Also, I think it's good to butcher sacred cows. Um, in other words, there are certain things that you're not supposed to talk about in the art world. Um, the more recent book, uh, 2014, Recollection, or Recollection, Rick, how do we name it? I don't know, we don't know how to, how to speak the title. It's variable, yes. Art, New Media, and Social Memory talks about, um, talks about how to preserve works in new media and also ephemeral and performative you know, formats. And um, it really deviates from the um, from the norm of, well, you, you consign it over to a conservation lab and you let the experts take care of it. We're basically saying, no, the experts don't know how to handle this and we should be looking outside the museum walls to find solutions. Something that we think, frankly, will, well, I think, will piss off a lot of conservators and curators. What's the result we got? Well, the result we got was a review like this from a guy named John G. Hanhart. This book will arrive like a bombshell in the twin <laughs> citadels of art museums and conservation departments. Yes, that's what you want to hear, right? You don't want to hear, okay, someone has contributed yet another book to this exciting new field that no one's going to read, right? You want to say, this is a controversial book. This is something that people are going to start arguments about. Um, cut the crap. What's at stake constitutes Pipilotti's wrist's ludic return to the chromatic semiotics of pictorial space? No. Pipilotti wrist plays with color, okay? <laughs> Speak in language that ordinary people understand. We get used to a level of expertise being associated with jargon. I don't think that's true. I think that there's other fields that have a lot of jargon. Um, I studied high energy physics, as uh, Mark Tribe let out of the bag. Um, and there's a famous guy in that field named Richard Feynman who was doing work that it took decades for, for people like me to even half understand. And he said, if you can't explain your theory in ordinary terms to an average person, you don't understand it. Well, if Richard Feynman can say that, I think art writers can say that too. What else can we do? I find it best to write when I'm outraged or when I'm in love, right? It's hard for me to write about something that I don't feel very powerfully, you know, powerful, passionate emotion about. So uh, there was a initiative uh, around uh, 2000 called Dot Museum, which really pissed me off. It was an attempt to create a higher level domain like those suffixes you see, .com, .org, .net, but just for museums. 
And it was probably well-minded. It came out of sort of the this, this scientific natural history museum movement. Um, I won't mention names. But uh, their goal was to get all the other museums around to adopt this. The problem for me was that it was an early time in the web when people were trying all kinds of different models for museums. There were things like the Web Museum, the Web Louvre, which was better than the actual website for the Louvre. Um, there were things like Rhizome, which has a collection, and yet at the time, according to the International Council of Museums, did not qualify as a museum. So this dot museum would have drawn a line right down the middle of all these interesting online experiments and put the legitimate brick and mortar museums on one side and all these iffy, crazy artists' experiments on the other. I thought that was wrong. I wrote an open letter. Uh, lots of other people joined in. And today, I'm very happy to say that Dot Museum is actually owned, that domain, by less than 10% of brick and mortar museums today. So it was a flop. I can't take complete credit for it, but I did get pissed off, and I wrote a nice letter about it. Um, so when you find something that's, that impassions you, it usually is best to go and find, like, it's, it's, it's rare that I, you know, walk out of a gallery, say, and, and see a, a work that I hate, and then go and decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack that work at home. But people do say things online, in articles, in comments, and email lists, that I feel like, okay, here's a way where I can be in dialogue with people. And maybe I will, you know, vent my frustration, and wipe the spittle off my jaws, and then they will correct me and say, well, actually, John, you didn't realize this. And I'll be, oh, OK, I changed my mind. We both learned in that process. So dialogic, the, the internet gives us a lot of places where we can have dialogue with people. And I found that after those dialogues, it, it, it clarifies my thinking, and I can go and write about it for you know, a magazine or a book later. I also think you should preach to the heathen. We're used to preaching to the choir, right? I'm kind of preaching to the choir in this room. You're all new media art conoscenti, or students thereof. Um, and I was invited to do reviews of books in the field of new media by the Ludwig uh, Boltzmann uh, Institute um, in Austria. And I said, well, you know, I'm happy to write these reviews, but I think, who's going to see them? And they said, well, we're going to create this whole new part of our website where people will go. And I was like, I don't know how many people are really going to go look at these. Tell you what, I'll write the reviews, but I'll write them on Amazon. Like, well, why would you write them on Amazon? Who's going to look at them there? Everybody's going to look at them there. People go to Amazon to look for books. I'm going to write reviews about books that people would not ordinarily see, and then they'll go and look at those, and maybe they'll be recommended, and it will continue. And I can't say whether more people bought these books about you know, new media culture because they were on Amazon, but I felt better because I felt like I wasn't just preaching to the choir. Um, publish promiscuously. I recommend publishing in you know, nice peer-reviewed journals. Books, if you can get them. Magazines, sleazy art magazines, great but also publish in blogs, publish in comments, publish in email forums. And when you do, when you do get that contract from, ooh, I got a contract from you know, MIT Press or you know, whatever, it'll say, you're handing over your copyright to us and you can't post it on your own website. And what I do is I go in with a little pen and write that out, cross that out, and I send it back to them. I have never, ever had a publisher return to me saying, hey, you have to, you have to give us the copyright. I always write in, I can you know, pr archive on my own website. What that means is basically anyone can always access your writing. Because a lot of times with these journals, they're behind a paywall, or they're hard to get to, people can't find them. And you can't do things like repurpose them as like an Amazon review or your own blog. So um, I, you know, this might be something you're not comfortable doing when you're an emerging writer. But certainly, once you've written a few articles, I strongly recommend crossing it out and writing in your own terms. You'd be surprised how often they have no problem with that. I think stamina counts. Okay. Um, I've been at this for a while, um, and I've had my share of setbacks. You know, when I applied to be uh, at the Guggenheim, it was to be a guard. They mistakenly hired me as a curator. <laughs> True story. Um, when, I apply, when I submitted my first article to a sleazy art magazine, which won't be named, but it's the one on the left, um, I actually got some advice from someone who had published before who said, don't bother to write the whole article. Send them an abstract, you know, a paragraph or a couple paragraphs, and, and maybe some illustration ideas. And then if they accept it, then you can write the whole thing and you won't have wasted your time. So like, OK, I'll pitch this article to Flash Art. And you know, I wrote a couple of articles, or a couple of paragraphs. And I made some color copies. Yeah, back in the day, we had color copies of, of artworks that I wanted to include as images. And I sent them off to them. No, didn't hear a word. All right, well, you know, there it goes. Uh, they didn't publish it. Three months later, I see the magazine come in. They publish my abstract. 
along with the shitty color copies that I sent just as ideas. I was like, oh my gosh, everyone's going to hate me. I never even got permission for the, the images. You know what? I survived, right? You just, you have things like that happen and you keep going. Um, art Bite was a column. This was this crazy magazine that just started up to cover digital art. Um, I was, you know, they said, hey, you know, would you like to write a column? I said, sure. I didn't realize how much work it is, but yeah, writing a column every month gets you out there, gets your name out there. And it's busy, it's hard. You kind of, you know, it's like an endurance, like a marathon. Magazine folded after, after two years after the dot com bust. But that kind of got my name out there and got more, you know, kind of attention after that. Cultivate worthy adversaries. We think that the people who disagree with us are to be silenced or argued you know, out of existence. They are our bread and butter, the good ones, not the people who are trolls and like, meaningless criticisms. But if you can find people who disagree with you intellectually and well and articulately, they are invaluable. Because when you write now, you're not just writing in a garret like some writer in the you know, 19th century. You're, it's more like, like you know, shouting in this room and other people shouting back because there's Twitter and there's blog, you know, blog rolls and there's all these ways for people to communicate. So if you can get that conversation started on a high level, that's invaluable. And those other people who are shouting back at you in that room, they'll draw more people into the space because they'll go, oh, something interesting is happening in that room. That's what you want to happen. You want cultivate, to cultivate worthy adversaries. Finally, know your victory conditions. Right? You're not going to persuade the whole world that you're right. What can you do? Well, Godwin's Law. Godwin's Law says once someone on an email list or some other forum context starts comparing the situation to fascism and Hitler, no intelligent conversation can happen after that. So if you believe Godwin's Law or variation of that, then when you're going back and forth you know, in YouTube comments or in a forum or some other place with someone and they stoop to a level that is like you don't even feel like you should refer to because at that point it's ad hominem. It's just like you were saying like that's the best you can come up with. Just stop. Just walk away. You have won. That is a victory condition because they have stretched themselves out so far that they've embarrassed themselves. I remember a story of, uh, uh, I used to study uh, Tai Chi and a friend of mine did push hands in this park in China uh, where you kind of try to push each other over but it's very gentle. And there was an old lady and she'd get all these big strapping young guys to go do push hands with her. And they would you know, throw each other across the park and she would get to the point just when they were off balance and then she'd let go and smile and bow. And that's what you want. Um, the other victory condition is when other people have your idea and they think that they came up with the idea. And they talk about your idea. And I've had this happen a fair amount of times. Once a very well-known curator started talking about, oh, you know, when we look at Dan Flavin's work, that could be a, you know, a problem because how are we gonna preserve that in the future? And that could apply to digital work too. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> right? The victory condition is not that you win and you get all the attention. The victory attention, condition is you get some attention, but mostly your ideas get attention. Because if people go back and look, they will see that those ideas originated in you, and those ideas will have a bigger life than just you alone. So that's how to write art criticism <laughs> in 10 minutes. And I look forward to the conversation. Okay. Thank you very much.